Okay, excellent. Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to the first uh, SNEV podcast. Uh, we're super excited to get this going. Um, I'll just do a quick introduction of myself and then uh, my co-host here, Jan, uh, needs no introduction, but can do one for himself as well. Uh, and then we'll kind of uh, talk about what we have planned for today. Um, so my name is uh, Sam Al-Musa. Uh, everyone calls me Sammy. I'm a um, technically a sixth year, I guess, a, a third year graduate student and third year medical student at Wake Forest School of Medicine in North Carolina. And I originally hail from Chicago. I should be one of the hosts on the student network for extracellular vesicle end. And oftentimes we'll be pairing with um, someone who's established in the field. Uh, and this leads me to introducing uh, Jan. Jan. Hello, Sam. It's uh, great to uh, <laughs> do this with you. It's uh, it was a few months in the in the planning, um, and then I moved house and stuff like that. So basically, my name is Jan Lötvall. I'm um, an MD PhD uh, trained in Sweden. I, I work at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. I also call myself exosomologist. So I'm not sure that's a word that can be used anymore because people prefer extracellular vesicles, but um, Sometimes I use that that term anyway. Uh, so uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm an MD PhD. I'm a professor of allergy, but I've done a lot of translational research over the last oh, since I started doing research actually already in the 80s, uh, and I continue doing that also after becoming a, 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 a specialist and a, and a and a full professor. Uh, and right now I'm not not very clinically active, but very scientifically active. So we ran into the field of uh, exosomes at that time, back in the early 2000s. Uh, we had a, a person locally here that was interested in immunologists called Espion Tillemo, who uh, was doing some work on extracellular vesicles. Uh, back in the late 90s, he has a paper on what he called them, tolerosomes, uh, tolerizing, immune tolerizing uh, vesicle-like substances. So... Uh, yeah, we started working in that with that in the allergy field and had issues, and then then we stumbled into onto the uh, RNA uh, presence in the extracellular vesicles. We published that in in two thousand and seven, and after that, uh, the focus became extracellular vesicles. Clearly, um, even though we sort of slipped into this field by a little bit by accident and. You have to follow the data, right? As a scientist, so I had no idea I would become a nanobiologist or exosome researcher, but that's that's right. what I am. Uh... So, so this was okay. So that's an introduction of yourself, but that's also kind of a segue into a topic that we we're discussing today, which is the early evolution of ISEV. So your paper it was published in two thousand. I thought it was. Uh, on RNA within EVs. Was that 2007 or 2008? Yes, seven. 2007. So the, so the first meeting um, of EVologists around the world, this was um, in Montreal, correct? Right. I was not there. Okay. So it, it, what, do you know what had led up to these meetings, whether it's the Montreal meeting of um, 20, uh, 2005 or um, afterwards in uh, Paris in 2000 and is it 11? 11, that's 11, exactly. So when, so when did it become apparent? Why did it become apparent that, okay, hey, we need to all start meeting and maybe we form this international society? So uh, Espion, who I was collaborating with at the time and who inspired us to work on extracellular vesicles back in the early 2000s, he uh, he attended that meeting in 2005, which was initiated by Rose uh, Johnston, unfortunately passed away a number of years ago now. Um, but uh, I, I have no, not very much information about that meeting. I think uh, Clotilde was there. I think Graza Raposo might have been there as well. So I think you should definitely uh, run a podcast with them, maybe more than one of them, and talk about that specific meeting, because I'm so sure that was very inspirational but you have to remember that time there were there were the thinking was that exosomes were something very unique and it was an exosome meeting right and 
and the larger vesicles that were found in, in uh, different biofluids there were not considered to be um, exosomes. So there was a, a, I wouldn't call it a rift, but a, a uh, there's been a paradigm shift, uh, let's put it that way, over the last 20 years in how we think about these vesicles. And, uh, and uh, it's not necessarily the stuff that is pelleted at, 100,000 GE over 70 minutes, that is the, uh, that is the uh, only important stuff. So yeah, there's been a lot of evolution on how to isolate these vesicles. Anyway, the meeting was in 2005. I was barely into vesicle at that time. We were still struggling to understand what was going on in our pelleted exosomes. Uh, we we're doing some adoptive transfer experiments and things like this in, in, in mice. Um, and we're about to give up actually on exocellular vesicles. We were thinking there, probably 2004, uh, we were sitting there, have done some experiments and we didn't know what to do. And uh, should we give up on the exosomes and, and just uh, move on and do other things? You know, um, I had been in the nitric oxide field for a little brief time as well and decided that was crowded and, and, and uh, moved on from there. But uh, then we, um, uh, one of on one of the people in the lab, one of the students in lab, uh, actually the student that defended that that paper, two thousand seven paper in her thesis, Corian Ekstrom, she suggested we should be looking at mast cells. So of course, mast cells is closely associated with the allergy field, which uh, which is where I came from. And and she said there was just a paper about exosomes in uh, from a mouse cell line uh, that uh, uh, was published, and we we should try that, and we did. And we did uh, we did uh, a proteomics at that time. We'll come back to the evolution of of of, um, of I seven a little while, but uh, that's what we did. And we did proteomics of the extracellular vesicles at that stage, time phase uh, two thousand five early maybe. Uh, and we did proteomics um, mass spec basically. Uh, in those days, was not as uh, high resolution as it is today, not even close. But we identified, I think it was 152 proteins or something in that ballpark, around 150. Uh, and at the time there had been 32 proteins uh, identified in, in, in the exosome. So uh, we had a lot of new proteins and um, and then we were looking at that list and, and uh, there were a lot of you know uh, RNA associated proteins you know, ribosomal proteins and, and what's what's going on here? Is this a extracellular ribosome that can produce proteins uh, outside of the cell? Well, if it does, it needs to uh, carry RNA, right? Uh, but within within five minutes, we were talking about this and I, I was saying that, you know, we know that vesicles can go from one cell to another, then maybe they can deliver the RNA to another to another cell. Uh, so that took 10 minutes to think through uh, and another two, two years around to, to get published. But uh, it was it was an interesting journey. And of course, that had a had a pretty big splash uh, in the field. I got in touch with uh, Gras and Clotilde. I visited them, I think it was in 2008. Uh, I visited them in, in Paris and gave a lecture there. Um, and I gave a few other lectures in in other places, but mostly I was I was giving lectures on clinical asthma and things like that. So that was my primary topic. So we we met, we were in touch, uh, but they took the initiative to arrange a meeting in Paris in January of 2011. So that came after, so we had our paper, there were a number of other papers. I think Yuan Skog's paper was also quite important also in, in nature cell biology in 2008, also on our RNA. Um, uh, so they decided to arrange an exosome meeting in in Paris, and it was um, in cold January. Um, so and I decided and I, very late to go there, actually. But uh, but and they, I called them and I, and I emailed them. Yes, I'll, I'll come. I'll come. I said. Well, okay. So in at, at this point, because because I, I feel like in the EV world we have to focus on nomenclature. At this time, was it just an exosome meeting, or was it? It was an exosome meeting. Just an exosome meeting, okay. And then yeah, some of the organizers were concerned when people showed pictures of things that didn't look like exosomes. <laughs> this is not an exosome. We're talking about exosomes here, but I think, 
I think everybody come to understand that this is much more complicated than uh, uh, the mindset had been prior, right? You know, the, the gold standard of, of isolating exosomes at the time was uh, uh, 70 minutes of uh, 100,000 G in, in an ultra centrifuge. That was it. Uh, and, and you have that pellet, and, and that's that's reasonable, but, but you don't get everything. That's number one. You, uh, you maybe you have uh, washed away a lot of the material as well with your prior right. centrifugations of uh, X thousand Gs for X amount of minutes, depending on, on your protocol. So I think even ever since then, there's been an evolution of, of methodology. Uh, of high isolate vesicles, and we're still not uh, confident on how to do that in a in a super clean, super clean way. So, yeah, so we visited them, and then I um, uh, came to that meeting. After all, I was quite busy at the time. I was very active in the European Academy of Allergy, um, and and then we had one session which was discussing should we start a community or you know a society or or not, and what should it. Um, what should it uh, look like? So I was a little bit active in that discussion and I, I uh, suggested we should um, should just definitely do that. Uh, there were other people in the room that also were, were keen. There were some Americans there that wanted to create it from, a, I guess, an American uh, basis. Um, uh, and, and primarily, I think, People were discussing, you know, how do we clean up this field? There were uh, quick fixes, quick uh, isolation methods that were kits, basically. I presume to large extent, uh, depending on polyethylene glucol uh, material and and the like, um, and and it wasn't sort of uh, globally accepted or or understood what we what we got by those. So we decided to start the community and decided to. Uh, to try to work together to help each other, right? To uh, to figure out the methods of isolation and so on. So, um, uh, yeah, and, and I remember how how do we how do we implement this and how do we distribute uh, that sort of information? And and I've been very experienced from the uh, European Academy of Allergy. So I said, you know, we have a society, we establish the society. And then we create position papers. Mm. And some of the very prominent people in the room had never heard of a position paper or never, never thought about the position papers. But that's how the, the, the thought process around a position paper uh, was initiated. And, and scientific research seminars as well, which were early implemented as a, as a meeting. People pay their own way, but they don't have to, they don't have to pay registration fees. It's not about... Uh, uh, it's about creating information and no knowledge and understanding around a certain topic. So, so that was um, uh, that was quite quickly quickly adopted. Go ahead. Yeah, but so at the time, though, um, I, I have I have two questions. Uh, the first one being, uh, it sounds like a lot of it, like you said, was uh, just to clean up this field. So maybe like looking uh, today. Uh, retrospectively, uh, ISAV is huge. It has not only uh, standardization protocols, it has two journals. It also has uh, events for people around the world, both local and international events and, lear and learning events. So um, was there bigger vision at the time or really just let's clean this field up? Let's start there. Um, so that's my first question. And then my second question is, I think for the early investigators out there, how do you even, as an early investigator, is it a, you need to know these types of people to start beginning to have these conversations? How can you, uh, I don't want to say position as if, as if, you know, like this is, you know, you know, something important for your career, but how do you put yourself in a, in a place where you're saying, Hey, I have an idea. We should have these um, we, we should come together as a group. Where, as an early investigator, do you feel like you have the position to say that, or how do you go about doing it? There are tricks. 
and, and the trick is uh, you know, there, there are a few things you should think about and, and get people involved. That's number one, right? Be inclusive um, and build it. And if you build it, they will come. That's a classic movie <laughs> saying, right? Um, so what we did, this is we're talking. Uh, so we, we, we hijacked that uh, event a little bit in uh, in in um, 2011, the January meeting. Unfortunately, I was not there for the for the last session, but I had some other Swedish people that were there, and 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 we we made a um, a slide on running uh, the meeting in Gothenburg in 2012, the first actual society meeting in Gothenburg in 2012, and we had a slide of Gothenburg and and we had dates suggested and everything like that. So that was sort of on everybody's uh, retina as they were sitting there discussing the future of the society. So we, we suggested that and then, uh, uh, and then uh, through, I guess, discussions by, by email and by phone a few times, we decided to start a, a community. Uh, and um, this was also uh, late summer, uh, early, I think it was late summer 2011. So I, I was talking with Clotilde Grassa and uh, Peter Quisenberry and and others at the time to um, to do this, and we decided to start a, um, a, a interim board. Actually, uh, so we created an interim board, and I didn't uh, claim to become the president or anything like that. But uh, there was a consensus I should do that, so so I did. Uh, but in the meantime, um, maybe slightly before then, I can't remember exactly the, the order of events here. Uh, we sent out a questionnaire to all the people that have worked on, on exosomes uh, and published on exosomes at the time. We're talking more than 10 years ago now. So I had uh, Cecilia Lesser, who is uh, a senior researcher in my lab now. Uh, she started in 2007. And still, still definitely around. Uh, and uh, uh, she was a student at the time. And another student, Maria Eld, who's now in, in Stockholm. I think she's with Susan Gabrielsson um, still. Uh, and, and we basically went through the publications, picked out people, people's emails, made a list of people and sent out a questionnaire on, on how you isolate the vesicles and so on. Uh, so, and, I, and we got uh, with SurveyMonkey basically, so we used SurveyMonkey to to gather information, and and in that uh, flow of information, there was a um, uh, a number of people that sort of uh, commented and wanted to help and support the uh, the development of the of the society. And people like Yong Song Go, I'm not sure you've met him, but he's a excellent researcher from South Korea who's been working on vesicles for much longer than I have. Um, and and uh, and he he's a is a biochemist I would say, and and th really thought deeply about uh, extracellular vesicles. He got involved quite quickly, and uh, became part of a of a of a new board. So well, then we how we should we build this uh, build this society? Uh, so we decided to have a certain number of people from Asia Pacific, Europe, and America. Uh, at the time, there were some people that uh, started some sort of uh, American um, American society, but it never took off. Never, never, nothing really, really happened. Yeah, Peter Quisenberry um, and Douglas Taylor and a few others arranged a meeting uh, uh, one Easter. Uh, when was that? Probably. Uh, 2011 actually i'm not sure exactly which which year that was but it never sort of sort of took off so uh, but we we built this and then we had a, a an election for board members it was basically the the uh, founding membership that voted Ooh. who should be president and secretary and all these different things so uh, so it's an interesting process um but we had a lot of meetings then in the time um uh, when we started the society, which was we started uh, with the help of um, of some people working in my lab, Margareta Sjöström, 
And we started as a Swedish nonprofit organization in, in 2011. Yeah, I think I think I wrote down some names and you can and you can tell me sure. maybe their their roles. So you, of course, Clotilde, which you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, and I might I might botch pronunciation. Uh, Sandra Breakfield. Sandra Breakfield, part of the early board. There's another person that is uh, super important that I would mention in a little yeah. while. Go ahead. Uh, you, you, I think you, uh, uh, Marsha Wabin. Marka, Marka. Marka Wabin. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, this is, this is what I need this. Okay. Uh, you mentioned just now, uh, Yong Sung Go from, uh, South Korea. Uh, Lawrence Rajendran. Lori Rajendran. Uh, <laughs> he, he started the Facebook group. And this was a That's very correct. important event. This was also like probably February. 2011, uh, and he was a professor at in in Zurich at the time, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and then I went over to to see him. I could have been April in 2011, so I met him in his office in in uh, in Zurich. I was there on other business, but I took you know on the way to the airport, I stopped by and we spoke and and we went into. Um, uh, we went in and bought a, a URL because we'd already voted on the name, right? Should we use right. the term exosomes or should we term, use the term exocellular vesicles in the name of the society? We hadn't decided on the name yet. And uh, uh, the term exocellular vesicles won with a few percentage points, like 52, 48%. People love the term exosomes, right? Still, and still, still some people do. So, um, uh, so then, uh, then I was there with with Laurie, and he and I had been sort of coordinating this Facebook group that started. There was a lot of people giving each other help and suggestions on the Facebook group. I haven't seen much happening there recently, but at that time, it was it was every day there were discussions on how to do this and how to do that, right? And I was sitting in his office, and we went to um, uh, we went in and bought the URL. Mm -hmm. isf.org for like i don't know three bucks or something he did he, he paid yeah. with his own money <laughs> he, he paid with his own money uh and um and and then we hadn't we didn't have any web page or anything like that but uh but he was actually very instrumental in networking in setting up the social media is very active with social media or was very active with social media at the time so uh, he was an important person mark uh you know, uh, Sandra was definitely important as well. She was a senior author on the UN School paper for 2008. And she came to the meeting. She was part of the first board. She's not been active so much in the society afterwards. She has uh, received an uh, ISEB prize uh, one year. Um, uh, and, and she has attended some of the meetings. But uh, I don't think she travels uh, too far these days. I see. Um, yeah. So, okay. Go ahead. So, with more names. Yeah, more names. So I have ten total, and we just made it through six. Um, yeah. The next one would be you mentioned uh, uh, Grasso Raposo. Yeah. Um, eight is Douglas Taylor, the American, and and me, you know, based in EV researcher here in the United States. I, I was always curious as to seeing the difference between um, the European side uh, flourish, especially. Mm -hmm. And my idea is that there's a lot of, as you mentioned, inclusivity, sharing, working amongst each other. On the American side, I feel like we haven't got there yet. We have these um, uh, straggle um, EV communities that um, have not taken off yet, but you could probably uh, put your thoughts on that. And then the last two names were uh, Margareta, who I think it was a uh, a part of your she lab. was my my lab manager, and she the last few years she was managing uh, managing uh, ISEF. Actually, after she retired, she continued part time working uh, for ISEF. That's uh, incredible. And she loved doing that, actually. And then the last one was Espion. Um, Who's one? Uh, I I could be Espion Espion Telemo Espion. Yeah. So. So he was never uh, he never really uh, continued uh, engaging with the community so much. He went to a few meetings, not so much to the ISA meetings, and he's now retired and he didn't push his sort of further uh, development in the field so much uh, since he, he's retired at least. So so I haven't seen him for several years, but he's still around and 
<laughs> he lives not so far away from here. As 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 one of the, I mean, looking at this list of names, there clearly are a couple of in, essential people, and when I think of leadership over a long period of time, I'm always curious as to what's the best best method to 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 see this this baby child product of yours grow into something that you want. Do you think that um, it's important for you or Clotilde, I'll just say those names probably because they are the biggest, to stay on as some sort of executive role on ISEP? So for example, uh, I'm big into computing, Python, uh, Guido Van Rossum, for example, has a title and it's called Beneficial Dictator for Life. So BD, BDFL. <laughs> so That's do, cool. Do you, do you see yourself, the eviologist, the extracellular vasculogist, as, as maybe staying on as a beneficial dictator for life? <laughs> no, I, I, uh, I, I don't have any problems uh, uh, leaving, leaving power to others. I might, <laughs> I might get angry or I might sort of express my views very clearly sometimes when I'm uh, junk, uh, you know, visiting some of the meetings and, uh, and, and, when you build societies like this and, and get in new people, you get a lot of inexperience, always get inexperience, right? And uh, I've been involved in, in arranging big international meetings for more than 25 years. So, um, you know, we ran a 5,000 people meeting here in Gothenburg in 2007, actually. Mm. Same month as the paper was published in June. Um so I, I knew how how you could run a society in a in a smooth way, and um, you know what the what the hurdles are, and uh, how you deal with these um, uh, meeting management companies and stuff like this. So yeah, there's a lot of money to be made in meetings as well. So, mm. but I'm I'm not a I'm not a beneficial uh, dictator. I don't hope not. I am, I guess, yes, as editor in chief of Jeb, because you have to be at you have to be a dictator there. You, know, exactly. you have to have the final say in some way, right? Uh, uh, in in that sort of, and that should be independent of the political arm of the uh, of the community. Yes. Okay. And so now, timeline wise, um, tw twenty twelve, the meeting in uh, Gothenburg, uh, and then since then there was a meeting not. Not, was it every year or every two years? I every think. year, every year. It was every year. Um, what have you seen grow in that time from the initial meeting in Gothenburg to now today? Are, are there were there big milestones along the way that you that you saw like okay as an international community it's it's pretty huge that we've hit this. Yeah. So. Oh, you want to hear about the 2013 meeting in Boston? Uh, you know, uh, if it's in Boston, there's going to be some crazy stories. And it was uh, uh, there was in 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 April 2013. I arrived there on Saturday or Sunday, probably Sunday, and we were going to start the meeting on Wednesday. Okay. And I was sitting in my room. I was about to meet uh, another important person for the community early. The P, uh, um, uh, Fred Hochberg, who is a neurologist, close working with with Sandra Brickfield. I was about to meet him, uh, and uh, I was sitting in my room, quite close to. And then I heard a boom, and then I heard a second marathon. boom, the marathon. And I said, "What's going on here?" And then I heard a fire truck leaving just next door, and I turned on the news, and it was the uh, the Boston bombs. I heard them both. It was just next door, and we were starting the meeting then on on Wednesday, you know. So uh, so this was Monday. People were traveling on Tuesday morning from Europe, for example. So, oh my goodness! Can so I uh, started to do mass emailing like mad, right? Uh, we had a we gathered everyone from um, uh, from the um, uh, that had uh, arrived already uh, in a room at the hotel, and we discussed what we should we do. And everybody, almost everybody, I would say ninety percent, ninety five percent, said yes, we should definitely go on with this with this meeting. 
um, and and everything was pretty okay, you know. Um, and and people came, maybe ten, maybe twenty people didn't show up because they uh, they were uh, they were uh, nervous about going to Boston at that time. But I think having that those emails from us, right, in the morning in Europe. When they wake up and they uh, perhaps didn't see the news the, the day before uh, that there was a bomb and they realized it was a bomb in Boston and, they, and the email saying, we've had meetings, everything is calm right now, we feel that terrorists should not win, we will continue with the meeting, it's your decision what you, you know, what to do, but you're definitely welcome here, we accommodate you in any shape or form that we, we can. In, in a way, you got ahead of the news. By uh, exactly exactly so they had that news they can see the news on 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 tv or 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 wherever you found the news wherever. in those days so it was mostly radio and tv i think and then <laughs> you, at the same time you have that email from uh from from myself actually um uh yeah so I, so I that imagine... was an interesting, interesting event uh, but the worst the worst uh stress i had was actually on the Friday when Boston was closed suddenly and we had people uh, people coming in to give lectures and, and and many people were of course living in Boston couldn't get to the meeting because the city was closed because they were chasing terrorists right there I think the police right. officer uh, the MIT police officer had been shot and killed um, by one of the terrorists so so that was uh, that was very very stressful. Um, I we could speak, speak. This is becomes a little bit, but there there are adventures when you arrange right. meetings. That's for sure. Yeah, that was I remember that was such a tragedy, and it it, it took them a while. And I I imagine because you said earlier, there's a lot of money to make in these meetings. I imagine there's probably a lot of money to lose as well if all of a sudden all of this money went into um this meeting and then you have to cancel it because of some horrible horrible uh tragedy uh, it was interesting so you know i i this was a, running a meeting in america by swedish uh society uh run by myself was sort of a legal um somersault a little bit i'm not sure it would uh work today <laughs> because uh that's that's one reason why we actually have the society in the u.s otherwise we can't arrange meetings in the u.s but uh, the disclaimer, you should have seen the disclaimer that I wrote myself and I showed it to a lawyer afterwards. I said, he's never seen such a detailed disclaimer uh, that you, you register and fort majeure and all these things, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, so uh, including uh, terrorism. We had in terrorism insurance, actually. We did. Wow. Uh, we had terrorism insurance and, and we got around $10,000. But it took us about ten thousand dollars in legal fees to get that ten thousand dollars. So it was kind of useless. <laughs> End of the day. Yeah. Oh man, that's crazy. Um, okay, and then well, well, the the next, I think, okay, the next big tragedy, of course, is COVID. What was it like doing being in person? Everything's normal, and then all of a sudden having to manage the logistics of a virtual meeting. So I think you should speak with. I, I was not arranging those meetings, right? So you should you should uh, uh, okay. discuss with uh, with others on how that was um, how that was arranged. It, at last time, we did have a uh, a professional uh, management company in Tally mm -hmm. uh, in the United States. So they built up experience and and uh, initially we thought, of course, that we would be running the meeting in Philadelphia in in. Uh, in 2000 and um, and in 2020 in May, right? And I we I I, I said we sh should not cancel the meeting. That's the last thing we do, right? But of course, the other the day we had to because there were you no know, traveling going on, and and uh, I I personally I don't find these uh, large uh, virtual meetings very helpful. I prefer smaller meetings if as virtual meetings um, like this, for example uh or 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 smaller events the large events become very disruptive uh and and very annoying actually to find exactly where you want to go and uh it's sort of very technical there's a big big sort of wall between yourself and the uh and the speaker so i've noticed a 
which I should try and publish this, this phenomena, if there are more individuals in a virtual meeting, there is a linear increase in the number of people who are tuning out, who turn off their cameras and just walk away from the screen, who are, who are yeah. doing something else. Um, but uh, okay, so then, uh, then going back to 2012, uh, you said part of the aims were to clean this up. This led to, uh, when was the, f the first MySev was 2014? I think so. We were having a meeting uh, uh, outside of, of Boston uh, and the board wrote the first MySev uh, uh, together uh, as a yeah. board, as experts, uh, you know, let's say, and we were, we were uh, quite open at that time. It was a short document, and people and we, but we didn't exclude the possibility of using kits, for example, in some instances. And um, but but it did create some some discussion. But it was a good start, right, for for uh, the mice of thinking and that position paper and the guidelines and and trying to help people to do their EV research in a professional and, and, and high quality way. So, yeah, so those, um, actually we started, we had a meeting on RNA in extracellular vesicles, in exosomes, even before that. Was this in, uh, uh, I think this was in 12 or 13 in New York, actually. We had some help with uh, some associates of, of Johan Skog, who was working at, um, at exosome diagnostic at the time in New York. Uh, so, so his CEO was helping us to find a good place to have the meeting in. And, and flew, people flew in from, from all over the world to that, to that meeting in, in, uh, in New York. So that was our first sort of position paper and position meeting or research seminar, as you could call it. Uh, and we discussed the, uh, the role of RNA in exosomes at the time. I don't think we came to any um <laughs> conclusions oh yeah i don't sure if we have still come to conclusions how rna works in in extracellular vesicles they're there that's for sure but uh, and then I, but then we continued having these meetings as well a whole series of different on specific topics right right um do you think that maybe these maybe guidelines or maybe a having Guidelines or some sort of society, of course, as you mentioned, raises the standards to a you know more professional quality. Do you think it snips out the um, tinkerers at the end, those who are pushing some boundary of science um, that are tinkering with some boundary of science um, that aren't necessarily following all of the guidelines, but what they're finding is true. Um, and it's innovative, uh, and it might lead to some uh, crazy breakthroughs that's that's being stifled by some sort of. Um, so, so when I became editor in chief in 2019, there was I was a process of over a year actually before I took that role, um, uh, and I was interviewed quite extensively by the board, and they asked me, "Are you uh, going to implement the mice of guidelines?" Implement. Mm. implement right some people asked the word asked me whether i would implement them and i said that would be disastrous uh, yeah. because it could uh, it could um, uh, stop innovation right uh, stop creativity if everybody has to follow a certain protocol then you lose innovation as you said you lose uh, you miss discovery so i i i want people to consider my sub guidelines i think uh, the EV track is in a very important tool to uh, to uh, report on how you've done things, um, uh, but and and you know considering myself guidelines is is absolutely crucial. But following them um, extremely well is not necessary, I think. Um, but then, then you know we haven't talked about the start of uh, JAV actually. That, that was my next question for you. So with uh, the International Society, where do the journals fall in? When did they become implemented uh, as part of the entire society? So, uh, yeah, so Jev started at the first day of the meeting in Gothenburg uh, in, I think, 20th of April or something like that in uh, 
uh, and and we decided, I think, late in in uh, 2011 to start a journal, and then we tried to find publishers, and we searched and searched and reached out, and people thought we were, you know, then they wouldn't even respond to our emails. Um, mm. um, and, and it, it was tough, but we found a publisher in um, in Sweden called CoAction. It was a small open access publisher uh, that we. Um, contacted we also uh, reached out to Beale you remember Beale's list the uh, predatory journal maybe it's before your time and that was a very important uh, component in those days I was a librarian in uh, in in Colorado uh, who was uh, an academic uh, librarian who was listing publishers and journals that were uh, uh, predatory uh, mm. and, and open access was at that time, considered predatory. I, I think there were many non-predatory open access journals at that time as well. And, uh, uh, but some people actually called him and spoke with him and he said, no, this, this is absolutely not a predatory publisher. You should mm. trust them and have faith in them. And, and um, so he had QC them, quality control them quite well. Uh, they helped us start the journal uh, very, very quickly. They were not a big publisher. They were not a, like now we have Wiley, which is a monster, yeah, well, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, but they were accommodating and they were uh, helpful in getting us going, and and saw to it that we have a had a submission system and that we got our eight papers published on day one. We had a number of papers, um, in all frankness, from the community. Right? Who mm. else would submit to the journal the first in the first issue? Uh, nobody, right? Yeah. Um, so we we got maybe about 10 uh, submissions and eight of them got published on day one. Uh, and, and they were papers that were absolutely fine. They were great, actually. Many of them were absolutely superb because, but they were so EV focused that, you know, an immunology journal or a cell biology journal wouldn't find it very interesting. They wanted to um, yeah, publish other things. So... Uh, so we got these things uh, published, and then um, uh, after that, uh, which was the first week of the of the society, I was actually editor in chief for the first issue for the first eight papers, mm -hmm. uh, and um, got the reviewers and all these things. Got everything was reviewed just like it should be. Um, but then, what goes, go ahead. What goes into when looking for a publisher? Like, of, of course, you're saying we're a new society, we want to find a journal, we don't have any papers yet. What are the other important uh, aspects that you need to negotiate with a publisher? So it's, of course, how you share income, right? Okay. Uh, how you share revenue and what the cost is for them and how much we could expect to charge uh, for publishing in the journal. We did charge, we, we did have some waivers in the beginning, so they invested time and money uh, in the first uh, few, um, you know, a number of publications. And after that, we had a quite low publishing fee in, in Jev initially, but it didn't have an impact factor or anything like that. And the first few years, there, there were a lot of methodological papers that were mm -hmm. published, um, you know, isolation protocols, you know, the influence of... Uh, I, my lab has contributed with uh, people in my lab have contributed with a few of those, like how rotor size and and types uh, influence um, pelleting of vesicles and under different circumstances. How to get rid of uh, exosomes in fetal calf serums, or you know, basically exoset vesicles in fetal calf serum and. Um, there, yeah, there were there were a lot of papers that were were coming out that were important for the field. So we had citations that were hundreds, right? Uh, right. Uh, for some of those some of those papers, uh, some yeah. we had some early position paper from that um, meeting I mentioned in New York. Um, hmm. Standards for I can't remember the title exactly now, but uh, it was about how to isolate vesicles and and the standards and requirements. Ken Whitworth was very active in in writing that. Um, uh, writing that paper so um 
uh, and those were were highly cited and were very helpful to the community, right? And then the next hurdle was to get into PubMed. They helped us to get into PubMed quite quickly, so we were in yeah. PubMed soon, right? Mm. Uh, this publishing firm was run by a few librarians from Sweden, entrepreneurial librarians, I would call them, and and they eventually uh, did what entrepreneurs do and exit, and they sold. <laughs> sold the uh, the uh, company to Taylor and Francis. Mm. And that was just at the time when we were about to get the impact factor, right? And we didn't have the impact factor yet. And uh, uh, I don't think Taylor and Francis fully understood what Jeff could do for them. So, uh, so they, I mean, we had a great person working for us there. Uh, and, and she was still there when I took over the... Uh, uh, the editorship in, in, in August 2019. Uh, but at the time, they were they were really cautious about how much money you could make and nervous about how valuable uh, Jev could be. Um, so they, they weren't sort of really investing in it. So end of the day, the society decided to shift, right? Mm. And we were we were looking into into different um publishers and end of the day we ended up with with wiley um it's and, um and to get into pubmed does that require conversations with the nih or no yeah so so there are requirements uh to, to get into pubmed for open access at the time i think you needed to have like eight published papers mm. uh but i think we had like 15 or 18 papers uh in in pubmed so we I can't remember exactly how long we waited for, but we got into PubMed. And then, of course, the, the papers that were already published also got into PubMed. Uh, mm -hmm. It's the same thing for Jack Spire now, right? Uh, the, but the requirements are much tougher now. So you need around 40 uh, before mm -hmm. you apply for getting into, into, uh, into PubMed. Uh, but there, there are soft rules as well. So uh, one of the things we, we were... Um, Hit by we had a we had an editorial board that was basically the small ISEV community, the EV community, right? Mm. Uh, and 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 they ran an algorithm then and could see that a lot of the editorial board people were also publishing in the journal. So it was it it seemed uh, that was not for PubMed, that was for for Impact Factor, right? Clarivate were doing that, mm. and that's why the Impact Factor was quite significantly delayed for 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 jab unfairly i think because we had a lot of citations already with those with those early papers but when we started the journal there was a there was also people in the community that felt that no we should publish our ev papers in 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 proper journals mm. or nature and all nature, these other right ones. right yeah, yeah yeah uh but but uh you know, basically, end of the day, there was maybe one person in the board that was arguing that, and then they realized where we're we going to publish our position papers or our research seminar results or technical reports or what have you. Right? Mm. We need an EV journal. The world needs an EV journal, absolutely, for the community for publishing those things that other journals won't be interested in because that's not their their main focus. So end of the day, there was a strong consensus that we should uh, should start the journal. But there was this discussion before we actually decided. So that was also quite hard work. And okay, so as um, chief editor, uh, beneficial, beneficial, <laughs> beneficial uh, uh, dictator for now, what are the- <laughs> For the journal, what, maybe. For, for the journal. Uh, what are the key tenets that you think every, a, a good journal should have? Open access. Yeah. Do you have do you have a, a, a list of others? So um so for a good journal in general or for, for an EV focused journal, I'm I'm thinking EV terms now, of course, right? Yeah, let's do EV terms. Yeah. So uh I think we can we can talk about um about Jav and 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 Jav content and how to publish in jav in a separate yeah. uh yeah separate so podcast but yeah. but i want the papers and i i try to tell people that to send public you know uh inquiries for reviews and stuff like that that you have when you publish in in jav you're publishing for to the ev community 
to mm. the EV researcher. So there has to be an EV centric thinking in the paper, right? Uh, as I mentioned to you when we spoke, if there's a if the first paragraph is about uh, an odd disease and the unmet clinical need of an odd, odd disease, then it's a it's it's written for that community that deals with that disease, and and then uh, it's not something that interests all uh, or a majority or a large component of the EV community. So that's uh, that's how I think about it. Right now, we're not accepting reviews, for example, on. Um, on different diseases or disease groups or or organs, uh, there are some excellent reviews and suggestions that are coming from super super good people. But as a matter of principle, I, we think it's better that those are published in uh, in appropriate topical journals, right, and sure. reach that readership uh, because we don't we don't necessarily need those reviews in our journal. If, if there's a review on I, you know, somebody was suggesting a review on mitochondrial vesicles. Yeah, I think that's interesting. There's not, not too many reviews on that topic currently, and 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 uh, you would be welcome to to submit that. Um, and and the you know what else was there? Uh, yeah, contributions of of serum or how to deal with fetal calf serum. Uh, there was a recent. Uh, review on that uh, that yep. came came and and uh, it should really help the community that's the goal of uh, from my mindset on on what jeb should be considering mm. but there are other things as well and and certain uh, creative and and uh, uh, thorough uh, diseased um, based papers that also are published that are of, of interest for, that are interesting from a from a methodological point of view or from a mechanistic point of view i wonder as an editor do you ever wait like because not only are you an editor you're you're a scientist as well so you're engaging in the science reading in the literature are you waiting for this breakthrough paper this paper to come in that just shatters our concept of ev isolation um some of its uh biodistributive capabilities um, or its functions so one thing i'm i'm keen on on receiving and we've received a few of those is uh is um clinical trials actually uh and there are some clinical trials that have been published and there was one on cd24 in 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 covid uh that yep. came out from israel uh mostly mostly basic paper i guess and there were very little information about the clinical trial in that in that paper in the end i actually contacted the uh, one of the uh, scientists in that in that group and and suggested that they should consider jeff uh, but uh, they never contacted me and they decided on publishing some other journal but i think uh, at the end of the day that was not a very very uh, helpful paper maybe because the data was very very limited um, and, and definitely not following the my sub guidelines uh, no, uh, we track, uh, but uh, but but I you know, it's an I interesting concept, idea. right? It was something that yeah. really potentially could 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 help, right? The this engineered uh, CD twenty four positive vesicle. So, yeah, I, I think uh, I I'm with you on that, and I don't know if that's both of our MD sides coming through, um, but uh, I think. I think we're making nice headway on using EVs for diagnostic or prognostic. Mm -hmm. And I think because the, the, that's an easier task to accomplish. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but like the, a clinical trial, clear patient benefit, or at least, you know, trying, trying to see if there's a. I, I'm, I'm open to, I, I don't require a clinical trial to be, to be positive in results. No, 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 either do I. I, I would publish, I would, ex, I would consider negative journals, uh, negative results. Negative well. results. No, yeah, I, I, that's, I, I, that's, that's irrelevant. Uh, yeah, but trying. Just, the, uh, trying, uh, exactly. It, that, would be, that would be fascinating. Um, there are some things in the, um, you know, that are maybe coming eventually. We'll see. <laughs> I, I, I know you're involved in this uh, a ton. So that's definitely a hint to, the viewers keep keep your eyes out uh keep your uh, eyes open uh if you have clinical data do consider jeff 
Yes. Uh, it's something that the editor in chief is very keen on, and and I think the community would be very happy to uh, <laughs> to see published uh, in a community journal as well. So don't send it to a New England Journal, but send it to Jeff. <laughs> this is this is now becoming a pitch. Um, but okay, <laughs> that that that's excellent. Um, do you think? And this is I, I this is the last question I have written down or last idea I have written down here. I have uh, today um, established. Do you have critiques for it? Are there are there parts of I have that you look at and you think, a we should have done this differently, or b uh, we should do something differently now? Oh uh, yeah, I, I I I I'm not shy. I tell people what I think. So if there's something I'm uh, concerned about i i i tell them that i think um uh, one of the things um we did, were a little bit slow in starting jack's bio mm. uh, we could have done that two or three years earlier uh but this is you know we had a publisher at the time uh taylor and francis that weren't too keen right mm. uh and and now we have uh wiley uh yeah, we have Wiley, and it's it's much better. But I think it's actually what's really important for the community to do now, for all of the listeners out there, is to consider publishing in in Jack's bio, mm. your methodology developments and um, and things like that. So, um, yeah, uh, we need to Jack's bio is there for the community. Um, it's with a broad and focused a little bit than than uh, than Jeff. Jeff has a limited, and we, you know, we accept maybe fifteen uh, percent of all submissions uh, currently uh, because of different shortcomings. Not because his work is is bad research necessarily, because of some priorities and some maybe d- too much disease focus or 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 other um, shortcomings. So, so do consider uh, working with Jeff uh, with Jack's bio. Uh, with with some of your work and and sometimes a short uh, paper on with simple data is is uh, received uh, very well by the community and and will be cited extensively if it comes to a open access such as uh, open access journal such as Jex Bio. Hmm. Right, because Jex Bio um, just came about twenty twenty two, so it's one year old now. Um, it could have been made earlier. That's interesting. Um, and then last thing, students, um, young, early career investigators, um, what do you see their role in a international society? Um, is it um, only like, of course, there's the uh, annual international event. But what are other things that you think the early career investigators and students should be taking advantage of with the entire society? Uh, I mean, my my first thought when you bring that question up is that a meeting like ISA meeting, uh, it's bread and butter is the students. It's the latest data. Uh, it's the abstracts, the posters. Um, you know, that's that's what what's what's feeding the community uh feeding the meeting it's it's energy and uh i think the juniors are extremely important for a community um um issues with with juniors is that they come and go right Mm -hmm. only a percentage of them actually stay within the community even stay in science maybe in the longer uh longer perspective so that's part of 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 nature, but I think um, uh, juniors are are extremely important. I I think juniors also benefit from participating in. Uh, I mean, juniors should have an input and an influence on how the meetings are structured and organized, and and see to it that they get a lot of the juniors get a lot of space, right? Uh, presence at the at the meetings um not necessarily giving plenary talks or something like that that's maybe you know too tough but but um but 
proper what i think one thing that i was very disappointed with and been disappointed with several times is the space for abstracts for posters mm. at iso yeah. it's been much too tight uh, it's been uncomfortable to walk in and see those uh, posters that's where the core science is and and i think uh, that really needs to to improve to to broaden the opportunity of walking by screening many posters having standing there discussing with people around the posters now it's too tight and uh it's almost impossible to to have a a decent discussion it's, i'd rather see people having the posters up only for one day yeah. right and yeah. and and giving them more space and then tack down the posters and put up new ones the next day it's uh, that's the way i think so uh, should be should be done i think so i also think the the um the more um, po positive criticism of actual science uh, seems to occur in one-on-one um, -on -one spaces or small group spaces than it does at the plenary talks. For a lot of the meetings that we go to, um, big presentation, they present their work, um, and then there's an allotted amount of time and a limited number of people who can ask uh, questions to that speaker about their research. Mm -hmm. uh, I found that in a poster se uh, session or a opportunity, I really like that I7 is doing this year. So they're doing the, um, uh, they're allowing students uh, and those who are submitting uh, their abstracts to also have the opportunity to be considered for a oral presentation, not a big plenary, but it, it's a little bit you know, higher. We had the uh, oral with poster uh, sometimes, poster oral. right? Yeah. So, yeah. and then you present your work uh, and you basically you pitch your poster yep. for five minutes the day before or the morning before, the afternoon before the poster is up. And uh, and that accommodates uh, two things. Personally, it trains students to stand in front of people and present. Yeah. It accommodates the... Uh, universities and PIs that require the students to get an oral <laughs> oral presentation to pay for their trip basically there are some of those <laughs> around right yeah. uh, and um, and and it also is something that they could put on their CV that they they, they had an oral so uh, but I also think it's a, it's a we, you don't have questions right in those sessions you have very brief uh, presentations some people try to do the whole poster uh, in the sessions that's not that should not be allowed it should be one or two slides right with data and saying and we please come to my poster i have much more data to show you then and we can take a deeper dive into into how we did this work so something like the, that right? then maybe just at the posters i think a lot of great criticism of science that pushes things forward yeah. happens happens at the poster sessions where everyone's walking around it's a more relaxed setting. They can take mm -hmm. the time to look at the work up front, up close, not at 30 yards back in the last row of the, right. of the uh, hall. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's always a great opportunity for the students. Yeah. So how do you see students' uh, uh, role in, in an organization such as ICEF? That's, uh, that's an excellent question. Um, I think uh, for one, I don't know, being a part of SNEV, um, speaking to the other SNEV people around the world, one thing is we look at Jev, and this is uh, commending you guys, we look at Jev as the pinnacle journal for our research. So of course there's you know other journals, different impact factors um, that might correlate a little bit better with a specific disease model that we're looking at, but for most of us, I think, uh, representing the EV students, uh, we see Jev as a pinnacle paper. So um, I think for students, one thing is to try and do work in which you're contributing to the society, trying to shoot for Jev and also Jeff's bio, uh, that's important as well. Um, so one, doing work that will land you into one of the uh, ISEV journals. Uh, I think is one thing. Two, I think um, part of our role is um, to take advantage a lot of a lot of the education 
events that ISEF puts around. I think um, trying to keep a grasp on the ever-changing um, gold standard for EV isolation um, in different mediums, whether it's cell culture, plasma, feces, mm -hmm. saliva, urinary, it's always evolving, it's always changing. So sometimes going to these ISEF events keeps you a little bit more up to date. You'll always be behind, I think, but <laughs> a little bit more up to date on uh, those uh, gold standards in the field. Um, the third thing that um, I think is the role of SNEV might be missing in ISEV, uh, but I think with SNEV, you know, we're only two years old, it is to have a larger voice in ISEV. I don't think that voice should be the, uh, the it, it, making any grandiose changes. I think that voice should just be uh, talking about things that are, are important to us. So like you said, uh, giving us the opportunity to present at an international community, uh, whether it's for CV building, whether it's for um, to, to fulfill a graduation requirement, whatever, um, giving us the opportunity to um, seek out uh, other things that we're interested in. Um, I don't know, I, I, like a lot of times in the SNAP community, um, they're starting to think of things that are branching out of just EVs and more broach on uh, societal topics surrounding science, that being uh, mental health, uh, balancing, um, you know, how do you become a PI? Uh, how do you determine whether you wanna stay in academia or move into, um, um, industry or something <laughs> yeah exactly um you know i i think those are things that a lot of the young students young early investigators are are beginning to think about and also i mean I, there are science things too like um i on the clinic side i'd love to start a clinical trial and i don't know of you know, of course you know you and i have uh, had conversations but uh, i don't even know where to begin uh in starting one so if you know, ISEV were to be putting on events that were, hey, here is a, a investigator who is engaging in clinical trial research regarding EVs. And it does, of course, it could be a, a talk about their work, but also here's a talk about how this person got to this point. How did they even start doing this? I think that would be mm -hmm. fascinating. Yeah, we can we actually, I mean, I mentioned that to you before where we're, we've set the set our minds on running a clinical trial starting end of next year. Mm -hmm. And the amount of things that you have to sort out before the clinical trial can start and the amount of team that you need to have and the medical expertise and the good manufacturing practice details, that's a $2 million investment at least, right? To just get a GMP uh, produced. Um, if, if you go to Lonsay, it will be $6 million. But, you know, it's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> seriously that's what it would be I... uh, but but so it's so many so many issues uh uh well well we'll try and and um but it would be interesting to speak with these uh israeli uh, researchers maybe that that did that yeah we, uh, we, we inhaled cd24 over expressing uh, heck exosomes i think it was right Ex vesicles yeah yes yes i know exactly which one you're talking about um we should we should definitely reach out to them and see if we can get them on uh this yeah. podcast um that would that would be a good conversation i'll we'll talk offline um if there's anything else you want to uh, mention for the first uh, first ev podcast and your i don't know fit what is it 10th 10th podcast i don't know so i did a bunch uh, in the beginning of the pandemic uh, exactly because I was um, bored in my isolation, I guess, right? And I had a good functioning um, uh, Zoom. Podcast set up, yep. And I got myself a good microphone. I, I'm not sure you can see that here, but there's a big microphone here. Yeah. Um, I bought a camera as well, but I'm not using that so much. I'm using the web the web camera now, the computer camera. But no, um, I, I think I, it's I, fun as well, right, to talk, right? Yeah, exactly. Plus, too, I, I like your setup. Uh, you have the podcast setup. You have the nice serene background. I feel like mine is the beginning of a. Francis, <laughs> this is just Francis. this is just a picture that I took 
in the fall sometimes uh, in my, at my summer house yeah yeah I've got a it looks like Francis Ford Coppola is directing my background here with the dark I'll send, <laughs> I'll send you some sunrises or something if you <laughs> yeah want exactly to use. yeah excellent Okay, excellent. Um, thank you. And then to all the viewers, we we appreciate you guys listening to the uh, first podcast and feel free to email Snev or Jan um, any any of the topics that you think we would uh, like to have. Um, excellent. Super. Thank you, Sammy. I'm going to stop recording here. <laughs>